Hey folks, good morning, it's 11.30. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is John Benedict. I'm a technical marketing engineer with NetApp and I'm based out of uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. And I'm uh, very happy to be here today uh, with Rodney Peck of eBay PayPal and uh, my colleague Shiva uh, Chenia uh, from the Advanced Technologies Group, um, also at NetApp. Uh, today we're gonna go over considerations and lessons learned in deploying OpenStack um, in three different examples. Um, I'll be talking about things in uh, regards to a converged infrastructure. Um, Rodney's going to talk about uh, his experiences with uh, OpenStack at, at eBay PayPal. And uh, Shiva's going to talk about um, dev test in, within, uh, within NetApp. So, so, uh, so we've got, uh, after that, we're going uh, to hopefully leave uh, 10, 15 minutes for some, uh, some QA. Uh, so let's dive right into uh, some challenges that are not necessarily unique to enterprise, but certainly uh, challenges within the enterprise nonetheless. So from an operational standpoint, uh, any, anytime you're adding in something new, uh, like OpenStack that has a, a fairly substantial learning curve, um, there's, there's complex administration involved. Um, any, you know, in the enterprise, you always have those project life cycles, data life cycles. Um, things going from dev test staging production, projects going from uh, high priority to lower priority and then off to archive. Um, you've got to be able to handle changes in a very graceful manner, whether those changes are planned or unplanned. Um, and of course you've got to be able to spin up, scale out, scale up um, in a graceful manner as well. Um, and, and, and last but not least, uh, there's, there's always going to be some kind of security and uh, compliance is, uh, uh, certifications to achieve se uh, security and compliance issues to, uh, to, to consider. Um, design challenges. Um, you don't always have time to do a six month POC to design something that you can scale out yourself. At the end of that six months, if it works out, great. If it doesn't, you have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, you may end up with a management team that says, we're out of time and money, you need to go. Um, you need to go forward with, with what you've already got. So, um, you know, from there, you, you know, obviously that whatever that design, it has to be scalable, um, has to make the best of the resources. Um, and and uh, uh, obviously when you scale out and scale up, you've got to have some predictable performance. So, uh, you know, to kind of sum things up there, um, you really have to have a, a scalable, repeat, repeatable, manageable design. And then from the enterprise standpoint, when you go from traditional virtualization uh, to, to hybrid cloud, um, enterprise customers don't necessarily want to give up uh, the, the support um, integration and predictable performance uh, that they've come to expect. So um, along with those technology changes, uh, we've found that there's also uh, changing roles, that some of the nuances uh, for the folks that actually work in the data center, uh, sysadmins, network admins, um, folks that do the racking, stacking, so on and so forth. Um, those changes, uh, those changing roles means that uh, your traditional builders and operators are now uh, brokers of services uh, that, that have to roll with all of those changes and, and, uh, and updates in a rolling fashion. Um, essentially, everyone has to think as a service provider, um, whether, whether you're, uh, you're the overall architect or um, you're, you're one of the teams that does the racking of stacking every, everywhere in between. So, so one way of solving, the, solving these challenges is with a converged infrastructure. We happen to put this together um, on, on FlexPod. You could uh, potentially use something else. Um, but the, the, the big benefits to a, convert, a, a true converged uh, architecture is that, um, that, that somebody has already done the hard work in terms of putting it together, running it through the gauntlet, making sure that all of the different components work together really, really well. Um, it's not a bolted on approach. Um, everything's been scaled out and, and tested, uh, scaled up, scaled out, um, you know, break things to see how things react when, uh, when things fail. Um, secure multi-tenancy is always a big, a big deal, especially in, in, in regards to OpenStack. Um, and and the, possibly the most important feature uh, beyond scale up, scale out, and performance is the fact that, that a true converged infrastructure is going to provide you the ability to have full automation over that environment. 
um, your, your typical 1U, 2U server um, is, is easy to set up and it's fairly easy to manage, but it's not necessarily uh, easy to automate from, from that, that mythical single pane of glass or those couple tools that, that you have to manage your environment. Whereas something like a FlexPod provides uh, a rich set of APIs that you can um, affect everything uh, from, a, from a wide standpoint, from a granular standpoint, um, everywhere in between. So, so the, the basis of that converged infrastructure is uh, NetApp clustered on tap. And I'll make this very quick. This is not an advertisement. So a lot of folks uh, raise an eyebrow, NetApp and, and OpenStack. Uh, the truth is, is we've been involved from, from the beginning. Um, we've had, uh, we joined the, the, the foundation uh, at the gold level uh, uh, right after it started, right after the foundation was, was created. Um, and we've done most of our work around the cinder drivers, um, allowing folks to take advantage of things like uh, deduplication, thin provisioning, cloning, copy offload, um, things that, that existing NetApp customers already know and love about us. You can take that with you in OpenStack. Additionally, um, that's, you know, that, that's kind of a no-brainer that we're doing that with, uh, with iSCSI, but uh, possibly the big news is the fact that we've added in uh, the, the file services drivers by way of, of NFS. So you can do that today with NetApp Cinder drivers. It's been upstream since uh, Essex Folsom uh, timeframe. And uh, we're, we're also in the process of trying to break that, those file services drivers outside of Cinder into, an, into its own project called uh, Manila. What's a, what's a Manila folder do? Holds files. So we had to keep with the, uh, the clever naming scheme on that. So um, the, the basis for clustered on tap is we have uh, uh, one or more two node HA pairs uh, bound together with a 10 gig cluster interconnect that provides a single namespace for both SAN and NAS um, and can also support uh, as, as the foundation for, for object store. Um, from you know, your, net, your uh, NAS, NAS and SAN clients, uh, i.e. Cinder, uh, Cinder services attached to this, the namespace by, by way of lifts, logical interfaces. These are uh, storage connections are uh, completely decoupled from the underlying hardware. Uh, the, the storage volumes themselves are completely decoupled from the underlying hardware. Um, and then the other uh, virtual piece here is the concept of the storage virtual machine. In this case, we have a, a yellow one, uh, and a purple one. It's just a logical container that can, that can be part of one node or it can span the entire cluster. Uh, what these things allow you to do is A, you've got secure multi-tenancy built right into the cluster. Um, and we can do some pretty crazy things with the, the storage interfaces and, and the, the storage volumes and that we can live migrate them just like you would a virtual machine. So how does that impact uh, and enable OpenStack? Well, it means that, that from the, the same cluster, we can put together, uh, you know, we can mix and match di different, uh, different controllers of different speeds and, and uh, memory footprints. We can put together different, uh, different uh, disk drive types, so high capacity SATA, uh, you, know, per, uh, you know, pretty well performing SAS, um, high, per, uh, high performing uh, SSD, um, so that we can handle multiple SLAs, multiple workloads. Um, we can handle the complete life cycle of a piece of data as it goes from uh, dev to test to staging to production. You can promote those volumes from, uh, from the lower priority, higher density left-hand side to uh, the higher performing uh, SSD drives to the right or in, anywhere in between. So, so what we did from, uh, from the, the enterprise testing was we put all of our iSCSI boot ones uh, on the far left. We had our, you know, uh, with the idea that we would have uh, tier one workloads on the far right, tier two and tier three somewhere in the middle, dev test staging, again, somewhere between uh, the left and, and the middle. So again, being able to handle all of those uh, different service level agreements simultaneously, um, handle those life cycles, um, absolutely applies to uh, what, what enterprise folks want to do um, with, with OpenStack. So um, some other things that we have um, that, that, that uh, absolutely speak to, to OpenStack. Um, we've got uh, eight, eight major areas here, um, two of which are, are not unique uh, to NetApp. So for example, continuous operations 
and uh, seamless scaling, whether it's um, our traditional enterprise competitors uh, or some of the cool uh, uh, commodity storage solutions. Every, everybody's got something um, that's, that's worthwhile with continuous operations and seamless scaling. Um, but some of the other things we feel like we've got uh, some unique capabilities around secure multi-tenancy, the way we handle that. Um, quality of service, again, being able to handle multiple SLAs in the same environment. Uh, the unified architecture, being able to support um, NFS, um, you know, SAN and NAS from the same uh, storage controller, same cluster. Um, and, you know, again, the Cinder and Manila drivers that, that, that we're working on uh, upstream. Um, service automation, again, uh, not, not only the, the converged infrastructure being able to be handled uh, from a full automation standpoint, um, but the storage itself, being able to say, um, I want 100 uh, terabyte or 100 gigabyte volume uh, with, uh, you know, it's going to be on SSD, it's thin provisioning, deduplication, and oh yeah, that's my platinum volume. So anytime I ask for a platinum volume, that's what you're going to give me. Um, and, and everything else that you would want to do to affect the storage. Um, data mobility, uh, again, being able to migrate those volumes, not only from within the same cluster, but if you need to mirror from site to site, uh, cross country, cross campus, we, we can do this. Um, storage efficiency, I mentioned deduplication, then provisioning, um, cloning, copy offload, things like that. So the, the, again, these are things that absolutely apply to um, you know, being able to, to really help scale and make the best out of, out of OpenStack, and more importantly, uh, the, the application workloads on, on OpenStack. So that's the foundational uh, piece for our converged infrastructure um, in, in the enterprise. Uh, the, the Cisco pieces in the middle represent um, both the compute and, and network uh, spaces. And this, this really is a, a modular approach to uh, the compute and networking. Um, again, full, fully automated, um, probably the, the, the best uh, concept and, uh, that comes out of, of the UCS in, in, in my mind from the automation and, and stateless computing standpoint is the, is the concept of the service profile which allows you to take the identity of the server and move it um, to other, uh, other servers within, the, within that uh, framework. So, um, you know, the magic smoke escapes from one of the important chips on the, on the server uh, motherboard. Um, you know, instead of having to uh, adjust your network and your configuration for new MAC addresses, new WWPNs, new iSCSI initiators, uh, firmware levels, you, that, that's what that service profile is. You just take that service profile and apply it to a different server and that's it. No, no other configuration necessary. So um, unified fabric um, that, uh, that, again, allows full, uh, um, uh, a full automation um, at, at that layer. Um, so what about how did we how did we do the networking um, with with this with this deployment? Um, we went we ended up going fairly simple with with really good results. Um, we, we essentially used Open vSwitch as a VLAN provider. Um, my, my friend and colleague Stephen Carter was a, was a big help with with all of that. He's got some pretty big name customers on the West Coast uh, that that will remain nameless. Uh, but this is essentially how um, how some of them have decided to do it. Um, provides you know, the, the VLAN, uh, you know, using it as a VLAN provider not only means we can carve up the, the 10 gig um, in, in a very easy way, but it also means that we're keeping those VMs um, as close to the physical network as we can. It ends up being uh, very, very highly performing. Um, Rel OSP, why did we pick Rel OSP for this particular um, enterprise ap uh, approach? Um, again, you know, with, with some of the um, enterprise angles in terms of, of support, um, integration, things like that. It was kind of a kind of an easy choice for us. Um, things like uh, you know the, the fact that that Red Hat treats Rel OSP as an extension of Rel means that things like um, SE Linux and C groups um, are are built right into uh, to you know Rel OSP is able to take advantage of um, the fact that they've got a uh, world class uh, security team, a security response team. Um, that takes care of security uh, concerns very, very quickly. Uh, a complete life cycle um, that, that, that they've taken from, uh, from, from RHEL and applied it to, to RHEL OSP is a pretty big deal. Um, the, the learning curve, addressing the learning curve of going from uh, traditional virtualization to um, 
uh, hybrid cloud um, and then being able to show certification and master of those, those skills through certifications. And, and arguably the most important piece is support. Again, enterprise customers don't want to give up supportability as they move from virtualization to, to hybrid cloud. So this is a pretty big deal. They, they, uh, year after year, they rank, pre they rank pretty highly in terms of uh, support. Um, enterprise customers typically also want to know that, that they're dealing with a leader in the community. Um, uh, Red Hat is consistently one of, the, one of the top contributors to the code, um, showing you know, their, their commitment. Um, they're they're dub certainly doubling down on, on OpenStack over the next, uh, you know, next many, many years. Um, uh, the other thing is, is a, lot of, a lot of folks don't have, a lot of data centers don't have folks that they can dedicate to um, actually coding in, in OpenStack and contributing code. Um, they're, they're limited to resources that can, you know, work on the databases, work on the actual application that, that they're, you know, that they're known for. Um, you know, they're, they're money makers, so to speak. So um, Red Hat can be a conduit for getting feature requests in. It's not a guarantee uh, by, by any stretch of the imagination, but at the same time, you know, knowing that, that uh, Red Hat is a top contributor means that someone has a, has a decent chance of, you know, hey, this is a, this is a, big, this is a big deal to us. Um, it's a very common case that it's a big deal to other enterprise customers as well. So that's, uh, that's, that's the top layer of, of our converged infrastructure. So um, if you're looking for some documentation on that, um, we've got, uh, you know, I don't have time to leave this up uh, for the entire time. That's okay. We have, you can snap a picture of it. Um, you can also find um, QR codes to download these um, at the NetApp booth uh, downstairs. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to uh, Mr. Rodney Peck of uh, eBay PayPal. Here. Attach this. Okay, my name is Rodney. Um, I'm from eBay, and uh, this is an example of uh, using Cinder uh, in a typical environment. Um, the situation we've got is we need to upgrade a hypervisor. This is a very common sort of thing for a large company. We have no physical space available in a data center. There's no place to put more hardware, but we need to do a security upgrade on a hypervisor. The hypervisor is totally full, um, so we need to, to find some place to create more VMs so we can take the data offline. In this example, oh, I'm going to keep the microphone. Uh, in this example, we've got four hypervisors. Each has six VMs on them. The hypervisor itself, I, I, I'm sorry about the math, I just noticed it doesn't add up, but work with me. The, this is a 1.2 terabyte uh, hypervisor with six 200 gigabyte VMs on it. That takes up all the local disk. However, the hypervisor has 32 processors, not 16, and we're only using two per VM. So we're using 12 processors and um, six times, uh, 48 gigabytes of RAM. So there's a lot of space left over on these hypervisors, and the VMs are mostly idle. So we could run more VMs on these hypervisors and free up space on the first one, but there's no more local disk to boot from. This is where Cinder is the solution. We can solve it using Cinder and a filer as a back end, just with software config. There's no hardware to deploy, nothing like that. We've already got a NetApp in the data center. It's got available space. It's just a matter of using it. So again, here's the full hypervisors. and. John's redone my slides, so I don't know which one's which. So the, the ones on the right here now, we've, we've used Cinder to boot from volume, and we have now 7 through 12, these new hypervisors running off of NetApp. Totally easy thing to do. The, the NetApps are connected with 10 gig networking. The, the disk I.O. is actually faster than the local disk I.O., which is uh, kind of a surprise to legacy people. Um, so with that, with that installed, there's other things you could do. You could do VM instances backup if they're running all on the local disk, running on Cinder instead of local disk. You can do snapshots in, this, in the filer to do backups. You could clone them. You could just NetApp clone into a new volume and boot that volume. So you can, you can build machines much, much faster. 
because the machines are attached with cinder, if the hypervisor dies, if the magic smoke leaks out, for example, you can just start up another Nova and attach it, and you, you don't lose any of your local data. If you're using local disk and the machine dies or your switch connecting the machine to the network dies, you can't get your logs. You can't get any of the explanation of why the machine died. If it's attached to Cinder, all that data will be on your NetApp, and you can just attach another VM to it and look at the logs and fix your problem or move the VM to another place. Also, you, in, in, um, in PayPal, we have like really large volumes that we clone. So we have 400 gigabytes. Instead of moving it through Glance to create a new system, we have 400 gigabytes. You can clone it in the NetApp in seconds into another copy of 400 gigabytes. So that, that's a, a fantastic application of Cinder as well. So I had 10 minutes to talk. I think I blasted through a little fast. Um, Lessons learned, it works very well. Uh, it unblocks the vi VM migration. And, uh, but the main issue is that unless you have bonded networking off your hypervisors, you've only got one data path to the cinder. So if, if the switch should glitch or anything like that, you're going to have um, totally hung VMs. So it's important to have um, very reliable networking if you're going to use cinder for boot for bond. That's all I have. Thank you very much. After this, we'll be available for questions and such. Thanks, Rodney. So I'm Shiva from um, Advanced Technology Group and NetApp. So, um, so I'll be describing uh, the work that I did with the test dev team in NetApp to solve their use cases. And I'll be describing some experiences and some analysis of our OpenStack installation that transformed uh, the test dev infrastructure there. So the specific use case that we were looking at was the data on tap test dev infrastructure. So uh, the infrastructure provides the basis for NetApp developers and QA to add and test new changes in data on tap, um, which which is the storage OS that underpins our FAST series. And it's, it's, a, virtually, it's, a, it's a completely virtualized infrastructure uh, which simulates data on tap. And it's sort of medium scale with thousands of users spawning VMs daily. Um, and they deploy on tap to test any new features uh, that come out in, the, in releases. A typical deployment of a test bed in this infrastructure can range from a single VM running data on tap to complex multi-VM stacks, which could be a combination of data on tap VMs and test client VMs, which could be running load on, on the data on tap. So apart from the, uh, the regular properties that you would see in a test dev infrastructure, there are two sort of unique things that, uh, that we found in the test dev infrastructure, which didn't immediately suit our open stack sort of use case. Uh, one, one thing we uh, found is that um, most of the on tap VMs run custom images that are compiled and built by the user before they start, uh, immediately before they deploy it on the infrastructure. So at any given time, you have all these VMs running kernels that are all unique and custom modified data on tap. Um, the other thing about a data on tap VM is because it simulates storage functionality and because uh, it's replicating all the functionality that's there in FAST, typically the number of virtual disks that are connected to a VM uh, are much more than you know 20 and so on. Uh, and we notice that this is not a, the typical use case that is solved by Cinder. Uh, so I just wanted to point out these two things that were unique to the test dev infrastructure use case. So uh, here's a quick comparison of how the physical fast box on the left looks in comparison to uh, a virtual data on tap. Um, all the storage resources that's required for the, by the virtual data on tap, uh, which could be NVRAM storage or the data disks, are all completely virtualized into and mapped to uh, virtual disks that are all consolidated on NetApp, actual NetApp storage underneath. Um, so so why, why was the team interested in sort of adopting OpenStack and moving to OpenStack? And, and that's where we sort of came in and we uh, initially explained to them the benefits of OpenStack. We, we, we all know the goodies of OpenStack, and that's why we are all gathered here. 
Um, but the specific benefits that they were looking for was really seamless support for multiple hypervisors uh, within, within their test form. And currently, they're using VMware as the underlying hypervisor to run data on tap VMs. Um, but the promise of OpenStack to support multiple hypervisors and thereby expanding their test coverage on different vendors really appealed to them. Um, the other thing uh, that they really liked is the intuitive user interface of deploying and managing VMs. Uh, and for that reason, Horizon Dashboard and the ability to use heat to uh, single click provisioning multiple stacks of VMs and, and not placing the onus on developers to define all these complex stacks and having to manage them by themselves uh, really appealed to them. So that was one of the real benefits too that they were looking for from an OpenStack based implementation. Um, the administrators of the test dev infrastructure are currently sort of managing multiple tools to monitor the entire stack, starting all the way from VMs to storage. And uh, meter was one tool that they were interested in sort of using because it provided that potential to be this one-stop unified monitoring tool that can provide visibility into all the resources that are used by the test dev. Um, and while we are working on a sort of a pilot infrastructure for them, one of the main transition goals was to seamlessly integrate with uh, their existing infrastructure. And as you can see in the pilot architecture that we built, we, um, we try to cater to that a little bit. So it's a, it's a combination of all the OpenStack services installed on their farm, coupled with uh, a legacy service that currently runs in the test of infrastructure. I'm, I'm calling it the ONTAP service. And this ONTAP service, uh, it does a lot of things that are very specific to the workflow that currently exists. Uh, for example, the build environment. So I mentioned that users have to compile the ONTAP code initially and then transport these emo images to the, uh, uh, to the OpenStack-based service. So the ONTAP service acts as a bridge in order to accomplish that. Um, and it also does uh, several other things, which uh, I can go offline if you guys are interested in talking about that. Um, and then we made a few point changes to some of these services. Uh, I'll be explaining a couple of them. Uh, so. Some of the changes, we are looking to push them upstream. And then there are some changes that we made which are more custom and more suit suitable only for our use case. Yeah, and, and one thing I wanted to mention here is the, um, the, the actual hardware infrastructure that we used to build this and build this prototype is uh, FlexPod, um, which uh, John was talking about. So it's, it's a convert solution that includes uh, Cisco UCS blades and clustered on tap underneath. So um, try to summarize some of the benefits that we were looking for. And after building the infrastructure, these were the key highlights that we were able to derive from our work. Um, the single click deployment of complex stacks that, that include uh, on tap VMs and test clients was, was a big plus for us. Um, and I mentioned that data on tap VM uses NVRAM storage, tries to simulate NVRAM storage and the data disks. And essentially those, those two different storage data models, um, uh, the VM requires multiple service levels from them because the typically the expectation of performance from NVRAM is much faster than the data disks. And we were able to uh, simulate that with the help of SLO differentiated backends that Cinder supports with multiple volume types. Um, the multiple hypervisor support for VMware, Zen, KVM, and so on, as the list is growing, is really a big plus for us to expand the test coverage. And uh, then the vendor agnostic monitoring and reporting, again, is a, is a, is a nice bonus to have. So uh, in the next few slides, I'll be talking about a specific technical sort of analysis uh, that we were able to derive from our study. And one thing we found out was uh, in the Havana release, which, is, which was the target for our pilot infrastructure, we noticed that the compute scheduler of NOVA was uh, left behind compared to some of the enter enterprise-grade schedulers like uh, VMware DRS, distributed resource scheduling. Um, and what was nice to see was in the ISO release, they seem to have immediately addressed that problem. Um, so uh, for example, one thing that OpenStack Nova does not do is look at instantaneous resource utilization of the VMs and, and the host to make more intelligent decisions of placement of these VMs. It seems to only look at the headroom uh, based on configuration sizes. And in the ISO's release, I noticed that OpenStack Nova has 
created a framework where you can look at resource utilization metrics uh, and schedule based on that. Uh, and as that work is going, it'll be really useful for us to leverage that uh, and make it more, make our infrastructure more production based. Um, automatic load balancing is something that will be really useful for the infrastructure because uh, we have uh, a lot of ebbs and flows in the workloads with a lot of VMs being spawned and torn down and a lot of debugging going on and users rebuild and launch VMs again. So uh, really effective utilization of resources and consolidating all of them in as few hypervisor hosts as possible is, is a key requirement in the infrastructure. And obviously there are benefits to using OpenStack Nova compared to something like VMware DRS because it's extensible, uh, you can make changes. We notice that the API is pretty flexible in defining your own metrics for scheduling, um, which, which is pretty useful for our use case. So one thing I mentioned earlier is the, uh, is the nature of how sender volumes are used in data on tap VM. A typical configuration requires more than 20 sender volumes to be attached to, to our VM. Um, and what we noticed in the Nova volume attach uh, architecture is when you attach all these volumes with one single command through the Nova attach API, internally it still seems to do all of them serially one by one by talking to the hypervisor. Uh, so in this case, I've shown a picture uh, in which we're talking to vCenter and we're trying to serialize here uh, all the attaches of the center volumes. Um, so this was a significant time drain for us uh, in the context of VM provisioning. It added about 40 seconds for a single VM provisioning. Um, and uh, and we, f we fixed this with a simple solution where we leveraged vCenter's API that can enable actually bulk attach of all, all the virtual disks in one single command. Um, and this is an example of you know, one thing that you can do with open source code like you know, Nova and, and make these changes to suit your use cases. Um, so this change has really improved our performance of provisioning by about a factor of two or three and we're looking to push this upstream. So the, the, uh, the other thing I talked about was the use of silo meter and the promise of silo meter for uh, the infrastructure and, um, and what we are noticing with silo meter is it's still evolving. Uh, a lot of features are being added in ISOs. We didn't see support for VMware and in Havana, but we now see support in ISOs. Um, and as we speak, I think we're adding a lot more metrics and monitoring, uh, which will be really useful for both diagnostics, chargeback, and what all the use cases that can be built on top of silo meter. Uh, and this is something that uh, we really like to use for other automated things like you know, automated ticket filing if something goes wrong uh, in the farm and so on. Uh, so we're really using silo meter for that purpose. So to, uh, to summarize some of the lessons that we learned from our use case with uh, test of infrastructure and NetApp is we really like the fact that OpenStack is highly customizable uh, and extensible. We added changes, we added our own service, we were able to combine it with the OpenStack installation to suit our use case. The seamless support for multiple hypervisors for maximum test coverage is, is, a, is, a, is a big plus for us. Um, silo meter capabilities uh, are still evolving, but uh, the, the, the potential of one-stop monitoring service is, is highly desirable for us. Um, the other thing I'm noticing is uh, with the, uh, the capabilities of NOAA scheduler to bridge the gap with uh, an, an enterprise-grade scheduler. As that continues to shrink, uh, it, it makes our uh, transition a lot more simpler. Thank you. Yeah, back to, to John. Oops. So with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, open up for questions. We've got a microphone in the aisle here. Um, if you don't want to get up in the aisle, you can raise your hand. We'll still answer your questions to the best of our ability. Yes, sir. Sure. So. Yeah, so uh, uh, from, from the storage perspective, ah, yes, uh, was asking about secure multi-tenancy, how, uh, how do we implement that? Um, it starts with the storage. Uh, talked about the storage virtual machine. It's a, it's a secure entity within the storage cluster. In, in traditional NetApp, you would, uh, you would create, create a volume, export that volume, or, or carve a LUN out of a volume and, and share that out. Um, with, uh, with, with clustered on tap, um, you, you don't do that from, from the admin account anymore. You, you, so, you 
you have to create uh, an SVM um, that, that can handle NFS or SAN or both. Um, and and that, uh, that SVM, um, if, if you want it to share name uh, uh, IP spaces with the other SVMs, you can. Uh, but it can have its own uh, routing tables. It can have its own IP space, um, things like that. You can lock down... Um, you know, ports just like you would with Linux. You can say, you know, only, you know, you can say 80 and 443 and 22 and, you know, uh, other ports. You can, you can shut a lot of things down. Um, there's some uh, pretty good granularity in how you can secure uh, the storage. Um, on top of that, um, obviously we can do VLANs between the storage and the network, um, and, and that can go all the way up to the application. Um, the, uh, the, the, the Cisco Nexus and the six, uh, Cisco UCS um, have some capabilities that, that extend that uh, ex extend that virtualization or uh, that the security and then of course um, you know, uh, RHEL has IP tables, um, C groups, SE Linux, so on and so forth. So um, it, it's not just one mechanism. Mechanism we've got there's multiple layers um, of security at each layer that, that complement each other. Um, and then that can be used, um, you know, tenant to tenant. So we can we can keep Coke separate from Pepsi. We can keep marketing separate from sales, um, so on and so forth. Yes, sir. Yeah, I may have missed this because I was a little late. But could you elaborate a bit on what distro you used of OpenStack, or did you do it? Uh, absolutely. So. And um, it, you mentioned something about a flex pod and. Does that come with a distro of OpenStack, or how does that fit in? Um, so uh, what we ended up using uh, RHEL OSP, Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, OpenStack platform, uh, for, for multiple reasons, including um, uh, there, you know, being a top contributor in, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem, um, support, lifecycle training, um, you know, uh, a lot of the security certifications that they've already achieved with, with uh, RHEL OSP and, and the fact that there's a lot of things that are attractive to enterprise customers. Um, uh, the, the FlexPod refers to a converged infrastructure uh, built around uh, Cisco and, and NetApp. Um, that is not part of the distribution. It is an example um, converged infrastructure. Uh, there's other converged infrastructures out there that, that you can choose from uh, if you choose to go that route. But um, from, from our standpoint, we, you know, obviously NetApp has a vested interest in FlexPod, but um, you know, from, from our standpoint, enterprise customers can really benefit from the pre-validated designs, the fact that, the fact that you can do uh, full automation of the entire stack top to bottom. Correct. Anybody else? Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Oh. Hey, one quick question. Um, can you talk a little bit about whether or not you guys felt a need in, uh, for segre segregating your storage traffic versus all of the other types of traffic Absolutely. that the stack brings? And if so, then kind of what was your approach and if you can get into details on the Cisco side, I'd be interested to hear that. Yeah, so uh, the question was, um, uh, did, we, did we separate the storage traffic from, from the other traffic, um, and, and how did we do that? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I, I'm of, of the, you know, my professional opinion is, um, not only do I like to keep the, uh, storage traffic separate from uh, management traffic, separate from, from data traffic, um, but I like to segregate even the, the ind individual um, storage, um, you know, keeping NFS separate from iSCSI. Um, and the, in, in a true secure multi-tenant environment, um, I would even go so far as to say that tenant A gets its own NFS VLAN. Um, tenant A gets its own iSCSI VLAN. It's a little bit more um, on, on the front end administration and configuration, uh, but from the standpoint of keeping everybody separate, keeping everybody in their own swim lanes, um, it's, it's critical, um, especially to, um, you know, not only enterprise customers, public sector customers, things like that. Um, so the means of, of separating that is not only through, uh, through VLANs, but through um, different IP spaces um, and, and things like that. So, um, you know, obviously a lot of layer two stuff there, 
um, and, and layer three, but that's that's pretty much how we achieve that. So configured in the next in the next switches, um, and then um, configured in the storage and in the uh, the host, you know, the Linux side as well. Yes. Um, so, you know, Rodney was asking how many tenants per uh, per VLAN or per. Um, it could. I mean, you're you're looking at uh, the question was, you know, what what's the limit on the VLANs? And I'm I'm pretty sure that's going to be down to um, the, the the Cisco switches. I'm not sure what the what the upper end on. Uh, no, it's more than that. It's more than a hundred for sure. Um, I, I would think it's in. Uh, I think there's a couple thousand, if I'm if not mistaken. Um, four four thousand, yeah, four thousand VLANs. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? You coming up or you leaving? Oh, he's leaving. All right. If you want to know more about the cinder drivers that we're working on, um, all of that is available at the NetApp booth downstairs. So um, the, the cinder drivers is under a document called the NetApp uh, Installation and Administration Guide. It has everything you want to know about um, the cinder drivers and what will become the Manila drivers. So thanks.